So if you've got a Bible, open it to 1 Corinthians 6. If you don't have a Bible, there's plenty over there. Fill a hand you want if you need one. Anyone still need one? And then we've got sheets as well. Heather's got some sheets and pens, particularly for young people. But uh, I think it'll help anyone following this morning because it's going to be quite heavy duty. So if you feel tired, uh, it's probably worth grabbing one because it might just help you concentrate. We like the new layout? Yeah. Like it? Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll try it, right? The best thing it's good for is shaming latecomers because they can't creep in the back anymore. They come straight in, so I like that. So 1 Corinthians 6. Someone got a page number for those who need it? 1147. 1147. If you're new to Grace Mount, visiting Grace Mount Community Church, the way we do things is we tend to do uh, the sermon, kind of the teaching from the Bible first. We believe that God is God, He has the right to speak first. And then everything else we'll do singing, praying, comes off the back of that. We respond to Him. And so we'll take about 30 minutes now, give or take, and we're just working our way through the book of 1 Corinthians. And then we'll take time to respond after that. Let's pray, we'll ask for God's help, and then we'll get on. Let's pray. Our Father in Heaven, it's very easy to sing words like, All I have is Christ. But for some of us in this room, we've lost a lot to follow Christ. And so we pray that you would fix our eyes on Him this morning, teach us why He is worth it. And teach, it, teach us what it means to live a life in response to that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a bunch of you were here last week when we looked at 1 Corinthians 5. And remember we talked about it as if it was a member of our church. Remember what his name was? Remember old Jeffrey, right? And Jeffrey was banging out of order. Paul said he was banging out of order because he was banging his stepmom. And Paul says, listen, that... Even for a Corinthian, that is bad. But if you're a Christian Corinthian, that is even worse. Right? And Paul said, the way you deal with Jeffrey, who's claiming to be a Christian, he's a member of our church, is that you remove him, but that removal is for the point of restoring him. It's to bring him to his senses. And the kind of negative side of that warning was, we need to get rid of the little in case it infects the whole. And the positive side of that was, um, the old is gone, the new's come. Now this week, there's another issue in the church. I'm not going to shock you like last week, right? pretend it's actually going on. But imagine we had two other members, and again we're going to try and pick names that is unlikely for anyone in Gracemont to walk into this church with their names, we don't associate with them. So, here's my two names this week, right? we're going to have Barnaby, right? it's very unlikely to have a Barnaby in Gracemont. So Barnaby, and we'll go for Norman, right? Norman name it. If your baby's name's Norman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right, let me tell you the situation. Imagine these guys are members of our church. This is going to help us get into the text and think about how we deal with it. Right, Barnaby. He's bought Norman's car off him. And Norman's given him a really good deal. He sold him it for two grand, even though it's well worth one, like way more than that, right? Two grand, there you go, because you're a pal, because you're a Christian, because you're a member of Grace Mount Community Church, I'll cut you a deal. And in fact, because you're scrapping, I'll let you pay it up over 12 months. Right, Norman, he's done him a favour, right? He's been a nice Christian member of the church. But nine months in, Barnaby has not been paying his due. He's already six months behind, and Barnaby is nowhere to be seen. Now, how do you think Norman's going to respond? No. You're going to go nuts, right? What are you going to try and do to Barnaby? You're going to track him down, right? And Norman has done everything. He's been in a way that he haven't piped, and he's decimated Barnaby's reputation. He's gone public on Facebook, plastered it everywhere. And if the money doesn't come in by Friday, he's got some boys that are going to go and sort it out. <coughs> now these lads are both members of our church. What do we do? How do we think about that if they are both claiming to be Christians? Well, actually what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 
is going to help us think through what does it mean to think like a Christian in this situation and what does it mean to act like a church in this situation. Look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 6. You'll see it's a very similar situation. If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Now remember when he came to Jeffrey last week, Paul's issue was not just with Jeffrey and the wrong that he had done, but also with the church's reaction in tolerating what he had done. And something similar happens here. Paul's not just got a problem with Barnaby and what he's done, but he's got a problem with Norman and how he's responded. So there's a dispute in verse 1, and what has the guy who has been cheated and wronged done? What's he done with it? He's taken it out of the church and he's taken it to the courts. There's an issue that's happened between two Christians in the church, but they've dragged it out of the church, taken it into the world before a lawyer and a judge. And Norman has done a similar thing. All right, he's not gone to our court because we're more likely to go to Jeremy Kyle. He's a bit more graceful. But Norman has not taken Jeremy, uh, not taken, what's the name? Barnaby. To one lawyer, actually, or one judge, he's put him in front of multiple judges over in the Waverley, even more judges on Facebook, and more judges in Gracemount because he wants to find a judgment he likes and he wants a punishment that fits the crime. He's taken it out of the church and into the scheme. Now, in verse 1, Paul set up contrast for us. He shows there are two different places you can go for judgment. First one, those outside the church before the ungodly, or before those inside the church before the Lord's people. Now where you go when you are wronged by another Christian reveals a lot about you and a lot about what you value. So when Norman goes to the Waverly, goes to Facebook, goes to the scheme and says, well they know what is right and wrong, they know how to execute justice. They know how to deal with wrongdoing. But what is Norman also saying when he goes there? He's subtly saying, actually, God doesn't know what is right or wrong. God doesn't know how to do justice. And he doesn't know how to punish wrongdoing. Where you go when you are wronged by another Christian shows whether or not you value the world's judgment or God's judgment shows whether you think the world is wise or God is wise, whether the world is strong or God is strong. And guaranteed in this church, right, we have and we will always have disputes. Chunk a, bu I mean, chuck a bunch of nutters like us in a the room, there's going to be battles, correct? Or are they off? Some are caused by innocent misunderstandings, some are caused by our proud stubbornness, some are just clash of personalities which we have a lot of in this church, some are just by outright, outright wickedness. We're going to have disputes. But how we respond is what matters. Will you respond like any other person from the scheme, or will you respond like a Christian? This is not to be a place, using the language we used last week, where there is a wedge between what we believe and how we behave. Now what is surprising in 1 Corinthians 6 is, who Paul goes after first. If you have, uh, what are the names? Barnaby and Norman, right? Barnaby's cheated him out of the money. Norman's the one who's been cheated. Who would you go after first? You'd go after him, right? You'd go after the cheating rat bag of a thief, right? You'd defend Norman and go after Barnaby. Paul doesn't. Paul's got another motive. He goes after Norman because he wants to teach the church the bigger principle. He wants to teach the church how should you respond when you are wronged. And so what we're going to see is, if you've got a sheet of steam, four really quick things that show that there is a wedge between belief and behavior in both of these men. Barnaby's not just a wrongdoer here. Norman's at it as well. So four things that show the wedge in their, be their be belief and behavior, and Paul's going to show them a better way. Firstly then, verses 2 and 3. The blanks in the sheet are, you think you know it all, but your behavior shows you're ignorant. Read verse 2 and 3. Or do you not know 
that the Lord's people will judge the world. And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? And do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So Paul says to Norman first. He goes after Norman. Norman, I know at the minute, right, you can think of nothing but your two grand. And I get that. But lift your eyes a second. See the bigger picture. Who is God? God is judge. And God is going to judge everyone. He'll judge you, Norman. He'll judge you, Barnaby. And he will also judge the people that you are running to in Gracemount for a judgment. But do not forget, justice isn't just here and now. Justice and judgment are for God, the judge, on his judgment day. And it will impact eternity. Do not lose perspective. And then he asks Norman two unbelievable questions that are designed to humble him. Look at the two questions. Do you not know that you will, the Lord's people will judge the world? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Now there are many questions that the church goes, Oh, of course I knew that. I'm left going, What? That sounds bad, isn't it? Like, I'm going to judge an angel. Paul, t- like, tell me more. Give me some of the down on what it means that a Christian would judge an angel at the end of time. But he just lets it hang there. But he's got a point. Last week we saw it is not the remit of Christians to judge the lives of unbelievers here and now. It's not our role. It's none of our business, Paul said in chapter 5. But at the end of time, when Jesus comes as judge, we will join him at the judgment throne to judge both people and angels. Now what's Paul's point? How does this help Norman deal with a loss of two grand? The point is this. Norman, when you're wronged, don't run to justice from those who do not know the God of justice. Don't run to a judgment from those who are going to be judged by God. Don't run to the ungodly who will face God's judgment in hell. Run to the godly who have been saved by God's judgment in hell by Jesus. If God is going to use the church at that big end time judgment day, why would you not utilize them now? And he he says to Norman, listen bud, by running to the world, you are communicating something to the world. If you leave the church and run to the world, you are communicating to the world. The church doesn't believe there is a judge. The church doesn't believe there is a judgment day. And in that ignorance, you are making the world ignorant of what their fate is. It's dangerous. He continues, second thing. You think you're wise, but your behavior shows you are fools. Look at verse 4. Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. Is it possible there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court, and this in front of unbelievers. Now, you have to sense Paul's tone here. Look back to chapter 4, verse 14. Paul says, I am writing this not to shame you. By the time you get to chapter 6, what is he saying? I am writing this to shame you. Paul's mad. He's saying to Norman, listen Norman, by running away from the church... To the world, you are communicating to Grace now that the the church has nothing to offer in this situation. By running away from the church, you're saying the church is full of fools. You must be the wise ones. The reason Paul's heart is mad and his aim is to shame is because his eye is on the unbelieving audience. You are doing this in front of unbelievers. You're telling the scheme that the church is impotent in the face of disputes, that the church has no resources to deal with disagreements, and that belief in Jesus is helpless to deal with this kind of behavior. And the reason Paul's mad, and the reason he wants to shame them, is because actually, the church is the only place that has answers for these questions. And the gospel is the only thing that can heal these disputes. We're going to get there. But by coveting the world's apparent wisdom, they are making the church look like a fool. Third thing. You think you're winning, 
but you are completely defeated already. Look at verse 7. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. His eyes on Norman and he wants to summarize everything he's said so far. And he says, listen Norman, mate, you could take him to court. And you can and you probably would win. And you would walk out of the courtroom with two grand back in your back pocket feeling like a winner. But you still will have lost. Because God's reputation has been decimated. Your church has been divided. Because when a brother goes to war against a brother, the whole family is put to shame. The only winner is the devil. And so you walk out of that courtroom with two grand in your back pocket, feeling like a winner. But the truth is you have lost the only thing that money cannot buy. See, money cannot buy you a place in God's kingdom. But it can be the thing that keeps you out of it. So the fourth thing, you think you're part of God's kingdom, but wrongdoers won't inherit the kingdom. Read from verse 8. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong. And you do this to your brothers and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So he brings Norman and he sits him down next to Barnaby and he looks both of them in the eye and he says, this is what should surprise you. This should shock you. (coughs) There is no difference between you two in the church and those outside in the world. You're cheating like they cheat. And you're doing wrong like they do wrong. And so behaving in the same way as those that are destined for exclusion from God's kingdom, you yourself are running the risk of being excluded from God's kingdom. Your beliefs ought to have led to a drastically different behavior, but you are no different at all. And as a Christian, if you are no different, then you're not just defeated, but you are deceived. Listen, Barnaby, if your behavior doesn't gradually and increasingly fall into line with your belief in Jesus, then you're deceived. And Norman, same gig. If your behavior does not gradually and increasingly fall into line with your belief in Jesus, you're deceived. We saw that last week. The old has got to go. The news come. But Barnaby, you're going back to the old you of screwing people over for money. And Norman, you're running back to your old community for justice. You're both behaving like unbelievers, you're both running to unbelievers, and you are wronging and cheating your church family. You see the scandal? Now before we get to the good stuff, I need to take time to make a massively important clarification. And this will feel like a detour, but I have to say it. Because there are some people who have taken these verses and applied them wrongly and harmfully. You heard of the Me Too campaign? Part of the kind of hashtag me too. Now this is a movement that has courageously stood up to and shone a light on sexual abuse. It started probably Hollywood, Hollywood, right? All these guys being uncovered. We saw this week at Bill Cosby. Now this campaign has moved from me too to include hashtag church too. I even saw this week free church too. For people in Scotland who are coming out about sexual abuse that has happened within the church. Now here's the tragedy. Some churches have used 1 Corinthians 6 as an excuse to cover up the crime. Avoid their own shame by dealing with it in-house. And so have only increased the suffering and the vulnerability and the isolation of the person who was abused. The church has basically said... Let's keep it in-house and keep it away from the court. (coughs) Now let me be crystal clear. That is a wrong application of these verses. Let me give you three reasons why. One, these verses are not here to hinder the process of justice, but to aid it. The whole point of this is to call sin for what it is. It's sin. It's to call wickedness for what it is. It is wickedness. It's not to conceal it. It's not to hide it. Second thing. These verses are not here to compound the shame of the vulnerable and the abused. 
They are there to defend the vulnerable and the abused. When he says in verse 1, how dare you go before the ungodly, what Paul is presuming is that in Corinth, there are courtrooms that are kind of run probably predominantly by men and probably by juries who love to be tickled by a bribe. Now in that situation, who wins and who loses? I'll tell you who wins. The rich folk. The rich folk who can pay the best lawyer and can probably even buy the judge who gets trampled all over. The women and the poor. And so in contrast to that, Paul says the church is there to be a safe and a just authority for the oppressed. Third thing. These verses are not there to silence you as a victim, but to give you a voice. See, he ties this to chapter 5, and remember in chapter 5, he puts the responsibility for church discipline into the hands of who? Every single member. He says, when you are assembled, in chapter 5, verse 4. Which means that a church should not be like a boys club where the elders just protect themselves and exploit the rest. No, every member's voice is as valued and as relevant as as every other, which means every credible allegation will be dealt with by all of the church, whatever the cost or the re- to the reputation of the church. Church discipline is never a replacement for the legal process. And in such cases, I will always encourage you to actively engage with the appropriate legal and government authorities. This church will not be a place where sexual abuse or sexual predators will be tolerated, dealt with in-house, or just swept under the carpet. Capiche? But what this passage does say is that between disputes between believers, the church does have both a unique authority and a unique resource to help. Paul has warned both Barnaby for acting wrongly as a Christian and Norman for reacting wrongly as a Christian. But Paul says, let me show you why you should run to the church. In fact, let me show you what the gospel says to you, Norman, and to you, Barnaby, in the light of what you have done. So on your sheets, two things that the gospel says. Firstly, we're going to concentrate mainly on Norman, right? The boy has been screwed over. Here's what the gospel says to Norman. Verse 7. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? He's basically saying to Norman, why not rather just lose the 2K? Why not rather just write it off? Now if you're Norman, how do you respond to that? (coughs) You're having a bubble bath. Every answer to those two questions for me starts with the word but. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Well, but... It's my money. It's my hard-earned money. Why should I be wronged? Why should I be cheated? Paul says, why not? Now those two questions are great. But those two questions get us back to the teaching and the good news of Jesus. It's what Jesus taught. Listen to Jesus. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's what Norman wants if he's taken up court, right? Two grand for two grand. But Jesus says, I tell you, Don't resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. Let me do this. The only reason I'm listening to what he's saying is because it's what he then lives. Listen to what Peter says about him in 1 Peter 2. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called. Because Christ suffered for you. Leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insult at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins, live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Imagine Jesus, right, standing on trial before Pilate. And he goes, why should I be cheated? Why should I be wronged? And so he says, all right, I'm not going to be. What then? There would be no cross. 
and so there will be no salvation. If Jesus fought for his rights, protected his own interests, insisted on having his own way, there would be no good news for us today. It would just be the judgment of God. Here's what the teaching and the death of Jesus teaches Norman and teaches us. A broken relationship between two people can only be restored and mended through sacrifice. It's the only way. Someone has to pay. Either Barnaby has to pay the two grand or Norman has to write off the two grand. Someone must pay for that relationship to be restored. And in the death of Jesus, Jesus says, let me pay the price. Let me take the hit. Let me face the judgment of God so that you can be a friend of God. And so when Paul says to Norman, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Do you know what he's actually saying? Why not be like Jesus? Norman? For the sake of your brother, why not entrust yourself to God rather than trying to be God? Why not, why not rather treat him with grace rather than treating him as you deserve, as he deserves? Why not rather pay the 2K rather than making him pay the 2K? And who... It may be that as you feel the weight of being cheated and feel the weight of being wronged, you will begin to understand the way and the wisdom and the power of Jesus' cross in a way that you've never done before. See, how you answer those two questions, why not rather be wronged, why not rather be cheated, reveals whether or not you truly believe what God has done for you on the cross and whether you truly believe that God will right every wrong on Judgment Day. And if you believe those two things, you can say, actually, yeah, why not? Why shouldn't I be wronged? Why shouldn't I be cheated? And the way of the cross will guarantee, I guarantee it, it will mean you lose out in this life. But you will gain in eternity. Now, by the way, this is why it's so easy for Norman to run to Gracemount rather than to the church. Because if he runs to Graceland, he's more likely to get justice. He's more likely to get his money back. But his gain will only be temporary. Only be worldly. His treasure will only be on earth. The gospel says to us, this is hard to hear, why not, why not rather be wrong? Jesus did for you. Why not you for your brother? Challenging, right? There's a second thing the gospel says. The gospel speaks to both Norman and to Barnaby and it says this. That is what some of you were. Look at verse 11. That's what some of you were. But. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. That long list that he's just gone through. They pretty much come under the titles illicit sex and illicit money. And if we're honest, that is what a lot of our hearts pumped for to the exclusion of God. We were fueled for and by those two things. That is what some of us were. But but when I was dirty, when I was covered in shame, when I was swimming in my own impurity, he washed me. Jesus took my dirt upon himself on the cross and he washed me clean. That is what some of us were. But when I was dead against him, when I was running to hell, when I was rendered untouchable by my own choices, God set his love upon me. He set me apart from sin. He set me apart for himself. He sanctified me. This is what some of us were. But when I was guilty in my conscience, when I was guilty of treason, when I was guilty in his courtroom, he gave me his son to take my guilt. He gave his son's clean record to me. And in his courtroom, he declared me right. He justified me. God, Father, Son, and Spirit did everything necessary to transform my exclusion from his kingdom to inclusion. 
God, Father, Son, and Spirit took what I was and he has made me into something new. God, Father, Son, and Spirit, when they had infinite reasons to be in eternal dispute with me as an enemy, they said, we'll be wrong. We'll pay the price. We'll take the head. So that we might be a friend. And so listen, church. Listen, both Barnaby and Norman, both of you together. That is equally true of both of you. Equally true. Which means what unites you is bigger than what divides you. That what has dirtied your relationship is less significant than what has washed you clean. That what has set you apart from each other is less powerful than what has set you apart from sin and for God. That what has taken you to court against one another is less vital than the declaration that you are righteous in God's courtroom. Don't be defined by what you were. Barnaby, that is not you anymore. Norman, that is not you anymore. You are both in Christ by the Spirit. Which means this, the gospel that unites you is bigger than the sin that divides you. That is what you were. It is not who you are. So live what you are. Be who you are. Let your behavior fall into line with your beliefs. This is why when we have a dispute between us, when Saul does my nut in, which happens, right? And when I do your nut in, which happens, yeah. <laughs> what should we, where, where should we run? We're tempted to run to the world, put it on Facebook, go to the Waverly, whatever. Get it public, gossip about it. Do not do that, because if you run there, they do not have this. We run to the church because in the world, disputes divide and destroy. That's true, isn't it? Look at our families. Look at the amount of relationships that have crashed and burned. Look at the complex relationships our kids get into. The reason we run to the church is because the church has the gospel. And the gospel is the only thing that can heal and restore even the most deep-rooted disputes. This is not what you are anymore. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time trying to bed this deep into our souls, right? We're going to sing two songs. And if you're a Christian, this is what you believe. And in the reminder of what we believe about who God is, what he's done in the gospel, in these songs we need to be praying, these things would unite us as a church, even when we feel that there is a dispute between us. And these are the things that our behavior needs to fall into line with. So these are two songs we're going to sing. Holy, holy, holy. That's who God is. And then we're going to sing, this is, I, what, this is what I believe. You know that Creed song? <coughs> Say, this is what I believe. And if there's someone that you're avoiding under the opposite side of the church who's a Christian, guess what? They believe it too. And although we might be trying to be apart, these are the things that unite us, right? That's why it's good news.